It was a great weekend, really, really great weekend. Had a lot of fun, and uh, we uh, started putting up our Christmas uh, decorations. We got a, a jump start. I really like enjoying Thanksgiving. I'm not one of those people that just bypass Thanksgiving straight into Christmas, even though I am a Christmas fanatic. Uh, and so we got a jump start, put up some decorations, and uh, now we get to enjoy the Christmas season. So we will be going into a sermon series on the Christmas story, uh, and we hope that you'll join us for that. In Hebrews chapter 13, Paul is ending his letter here with some encouragement. And I think contentment is probably one of those things that it really, uh, really strikes my heart because we live in a very materialistic culture. Our culture is saturated with materialism, which means that that's how you find happiness is through material goods. And these Hebrews, they were going through a lot. They had their possessions stolen from them. Uh, they were thrown in jail, they were being persecuted, their families were being persecuted, and so life for them wasn't necessarily the easiest thing. And as you can imagine, if things are taken from you, if you're always in want, if you're always in need, material possessions like clothing, food, shelter, um, there's something that's actually, it's, it's pretty important. And so Paul was writing to them, and he's giving them some encouragement uh, about about materialism, about what it means to covet, uh, about what it means to want possessions, and what the Christian perspective should be. And he says in verse 1, he encourages them, number one, to love each other, right? I think that's pretty important. Whenever you talk about materialism, whenever you talk about giving thanks to God, I think it's really important to look to each other in this room, our brothers and our sisters, and give thanks for each other and love one another. But look what else he says in verse 2. He says, I want you to not forget to entertain strangers. So not only should the church love each other, but the church needs to love other people, people who are strangers to us, people who are foreigners to us. That is a command. He says, number three, I want you to remember those who are in prison. Remember, these Christians were being thrown in prison for following after God. He says, I want you to remember them. I want you to remember the people who are mistreated since you yourselves are, are the body of Christ. Number four, he says, I want you to honor marriage in verse four. Honor marriage. Keep the, the bed holy. A marriage that takes place between a man and a woman should be kept holy. And then he builds up here to verse five where he gives us our warning against coveting after other possessions. He says here, let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you. I will not forsake you. When we talk about what it means to give thanks to God, when we talk about what it means to be happy and uh, to have a life that is full, this word content really overrides everything. Um, he gives us this warning. He says, I do not want you, speaking from God, I don't want you to get caught up in wanting other people's things. Have you ever felt like that, especially during the Christmas season, these crazy people who go out Black Friday shopping, you know who you are, right? Uh, some people actually go out for entertainment. They just take their cameras out there and they go for the fun and for the show. I myself, I, I used to go Black Friday shopping. I don't do it anymore. It's just too intense for me, but some people like to do it, whatever. But you kind of get caught up in that, in that craze of wanting that thing or seeing that goodbye. And I'll see people walking out with like five or six games or five or six things of something. And I'm just like, you don't even need that. You're just getting it because it's a good deal, right? You get all excited, you get all pumped up, you want this stuff. And sometimes that desire can slip into thou shall not covet. When you covet, it's an intense desire to want what other people have. And it gets dangerous because sometimes that intense desire to want what other people have can actually turn into envy, which is wanting them to lose what they have and hoping that you get it. And so that's why Paul gives us this instruction to be content, because he gives us warnings all throughout Scripture. Turn with me to 1 John chapter 2. The reason why being content is so important is because it is foundational to your Christian walk with God. It is a virtue. Right? It is a principle that we should strive after, that we should follow after. And yes, we are kicking it old school. Sorry, you're going to have to turn your Bibles this morning. We won't have it up on the screen for you. So if you have your Bible, turn to 1 John chapter 2. And look what John says here. He says, do not love the world or anything that is in the world. For if anyone loves the world, 
the love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, verse 16, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, there it is, coveting, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from where? From the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. You see, this intense desire to want what other people have is called the lust of the eyes. The lust of the flesh is sexual sin. The lust of the eyes is coveting. You want what other people have. You just can't get enough. You're never satisfied with the material things that you have. You're never happy. You're never full, like on Thanksgiving, right? When you're full, it doesn't matter if there's more food or if there's no food left over. You are so full, you don't want to eat anything else. You are fully satisfied. And this is what John is warning us against. This is what Paul warns us against. This is what Jesus himself warns us against. Don't get caught up in wanting and wanting so much of what other people have. Jesus, when he goes on to talk about this, and just listen, don't, don't necessarily turn there, but Jesus said that when you are caught up in coveting, when you are caught up in wanting what other people have, it's dangerous because it defiles you as a person. In Mark chapter 7, Jesus says this, from within, out of the heart of men, they speak. And this is what proceeds from their heart. Evil thoughts, adulteries, fornication, murder, theft. And look what he includes with all of those heinous crimes, those heinous sins that we think are really, really bad. He says, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, and foolishness. He says all of these things come within and defile a person. This idea of coveting in Jesus' eyes is a very serious sin. He puts it on the same level of murder and adultery and stealing. He actually says in Luke chapter 12, verse 15, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. What's the first question you usually ask people when you meet them, right? You ask them, oh, hey, what do you do? What's your job? What's your occupation? What is it that you do to attain material things? We often define people by what they own and what they have, how big their house is, how nice their car is, how much money they have in the bank, how nice they look when they come to church, what kind of material things they can offer us. And sometimes we base our relationships off of those things. And Jesus says you've got to be careful. You've got to be careful because life isn't wrapped up in what you have and what you don't have. In fact, when you get caught up in wanting what, other people, uh, wanting what other people have, you can defile yourself. Your heart can become corrupt. You see, when you are content, you are satisfied with what you have. You don't have a desire for more. Everything else above your needs becomes a thankful blessing. Now, don't get me wrong. It is not wrong to have stuff. It is not wrong to have nice things or money in the bank. This is a virtue that we're talking about this morning. This is a heart issue that Jesus is dealing with. It means to be self-sufficient, to have soul sufficiency, where you have an inner satisfaction of who you are in Christ. You see, the Apostle Paul, when he used this word, be content, he used it in a, in a culture that suffered from Stoic philosophy. I don't know if you've ever heard of Stoic philosophy, but it's called Stoicism, and it's not that, right? The Stoics, they believed that as long as you had an attitude right? And usually the wise people attain this type of attitude. As long as you had this attitude where either life or death could come, it doesn't matter because you are at inner peace, right? It comes from an inner peace within yourself. That's what the Stoics believe. If I can just enlighten myself, you ever heard that word before? If I can just come with inner peace, I will be able to be happy. Paul's idea of being content is radically different from the world's philosophy. To be content in the mind of Paul through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit means to be free from desire from worldly things because you're totally and utterly dependent upon God. That's the difference, right? Stoics thought you gotta be totally dependent upon yourself. Paul says, I am totally and utterly dependent upon God. He is my strength. 
He is my river that flows that doesn't run out. He is the, the drink that quenches my thirst. That's what it means to be content, to be totally and utterly dependent upon God. You see, Paul isn't a statue. He has flesh. He has blood. In fact, he recounts in many of his letters what he went through, what he endured, the suffering that he underwent. And he says, I know what it's like to have a bunch of stuff. I know what it's like to have nothing. But I have learned to be content no matter the situation. And we're going to read that in Philippians chapter 4. And he goes on to say, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. You put me in a situation where I don't have very much, he says, I can be content. Why? Because I have a relationship with God. You give me a situation where I have a lot of stuff. I have a lot of prestige. I have a lot of education. And he says, you know what? I'll be content. I won't have this yearning desire to have more. Why? Because I have a relationship with Jesus. You see, he had an independence. And wouldn't that be awesome? I mean, think about it, right? To not get caught up in wanting the next best thing. To just be happy with what you have. To be happy with who you have to be happy with where you're at. And if anything else comes, man, that's a blessing. That's great. But my life isn't going to be dictated in trying to attain stuff. My life is going to be dictated in trying to get more of Jesus. And it really is a big picture issue if you think about it. When we think about this idea of being content, the big picture is simply this. Bad things are going to happen. You could lose your job. You could lose your education. You could lose your sight, your hearing, a catastrophe could happen when you leave these doors. Is your life going to be dictated by what you have and what you don't have as far as materialism? That's what you have to ask yourself. If you went home to a house that was burnt down, I'm sure that you would be devastated. But what is your source of joy and happiness? In other words, would your life be over if you lost your material stuff? Would your life be so much better if you hit the lottery? Think about that for a moment. Jesus' words ring loud and clear. Life does not consist in the abundance of stuff, of things, of materialism. You see, Paul's contentment here, it is so paradox to the culture. And this is so foreign, right? Right? I mean, think about it. Everyone says, I've got to get my child a good education so they can get a good job and so that they can support themselves and have stuff and have things. That's what our culture says. You see, Christian contentment is not self-centered. It's not on how I can bring myself peace. It is a contentment that enables you to do good. You see, when you're not bound by your stuff, you'll share it. You'll serve with it. Remember we just read in Hebrews Chapter 13, verse 1, love each other, love strangers, take care of those who are in prison, look after your husband and your wife in honoring the marriage covenant, and do not forget to have contentment in God. And so that is contentment, and it is valuable, and I want to tell you why, right? I want to tell you why it's valuable. Let me read to you a few kind of principles that have been found out throughout culture. This isn't just a Christian idea, and although other people have taken the idea of contentment and put their own spin on it, contentment is something that has been throughout many, many cultures because it has extreme value. Socrates said this, he is richest who is content with the least. William Shakespeare wrote this, he is well paid that is well satisfied. There's a Chinese proverb that says, he who is content can never be ruined. George Eliot said, the contented man is never poor, the discontented man never rich. Paul was so intelligent, right? I mean, this guy is a genius. And yet he simply wrote this to Timothy, godliness with contentment is great gain. You see, if you are content, and you're not godly, what profit is that? You're not walking with the Lord, you're not living a godly life, but on the flip side, if you're godly and you're not content, you're wrapped up in a materialistic culture. And so there is a both and this morning. That's why contentment is such a wonderful virtue, is because it can unite your Christian walk with God. As you're focusing on becoming a better Christian, you're happy, you're satisfied. You want to strive to be a better person, and you share with those who are in need. Fanny Crosby he, many of you might know who he is. Uh, he's a blind songwriter, and he wrote this. Oh, what a happy soul am I, although I cannot see. I am resolved that in this world contented I will be. How many blessings I enjoy that other people don't. To weep and sigh because I'm blind, I cannot and I won't. 
I cannot imagine not being able to see, not being able to hear, not being able to walk, but yet people find the true essence of what it means to be content. You know, one of the greatest things about going to a third world country and, and doing a mission, I've done several of those, is that these kids are happy. They literally wear the same clothes every day. Many of them do not have shoes. For fun, they love soccer, uh, especially in Jamaica. They roll up plastic into a ball, and they wrap it really tight, and that becomes their, their, their soccer ball, and that's what they play with. And yet they're smiling, they're happy, they want to hold your hands. Life is full for them. If they have a meal for that day, life is great. They are so satisfied and so happy with the basic necessities of life. And you know, when I was, when I was there and I would watch them, I, uh, I envied that. I mean, how great would it be to have next to nothing and yet still feel like you have a very full and rich life. To be so happy with a plastic soccer ball, to be happy with a mood, uh, for, with a meal for the day, I mean, wow, they've got life figured out. They understand, they get it. Let me read to you Philippians chapter four, what Paul wrote about this. And remember, in Philippians, Paul is writing from house arrest in Rome. He's had everything stripped from him. He's been beaten, stoned, shipwrecked, left for dead. He's been bitten by deadly snakes. He's been thrown in prison. I mean, this guy has been through a mess. And at the conclusion of his life, uh, he's getting ready to die, not too much longer, and he writes this, I have learned, verse 10, to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble means. I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Contentment is so very valuable and so very important. It is a virtue that we should all strive after to rid ourselves of this desperate uh, hunger for worldliness, for the lust of the eyes, and to hunger and thirst after God. And so I want to leave you with five ways that you can be more content this Christmas season. Number one, trust in God's providential care. And that's a hard thing to do, to trust that God is going to provide for your needs. And there are two basic needs that are defined in Scripture, food to eat and clothing to wear. Everything else is a thankful blessing. If you have a nice home to go into, like I do, if you have a nice car to drive, like I do, if you have those luxuries and those things, give thanks to God, but they are not needs. Trust that as a Christian, God will provide for you. Jesus deals with this subject. In Matthew chapter 6, his apostles at the time, disciples, are coming to him. He's, being, he's sending them out, sharing the gospel, telling people about Jesus, and they come back to him, and they're worried. They're worried because Jesus says, look, don't take anything with you. And they're like, Jesus, are you insane? <laughs> We're going to go walk through this scary mountain, and we might have to sleep on a rock. And that wouldn't be terribly uncomfortable to have a rock for a pillow. And you're telling us not to take anything, right, except for our basic necessities. And Jesus says, look, God is going to take care of you. I will provide for you. And he says, in about verse 33, he says, but in order for that to happen, He says, seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all of these things will be added unto you. You who are following me, I will take care of you, but you have to seek me first. You see, because God values us. He values us as his followers, as his creation. He says, look, I will take care of you. Look at the lilies of the field. Look at the birds of the air. Have I not taken care of them? I will surely take care of you. But look, a 75-inch HD 4K TV is not a need that God is going to provide you with, right? God is not robbing you of the luxuries of life if you have to drive a 1996 Honda Civic. God has not put his curse upon you if you live in a two-bedroom apartment and you can barely make ends meet because you can't afford certain luxuries. God promises to take care of our needs, and if you will be willing to trust in God to take care of your needs, the worries of this life will rid you. That is number one. Contentment comes then when we trust in God that he will provide us with what we need. Number two, trust in God, and number two, know that you can't take your stuff with you, right? This is a big one, and people have tried to take their stuff with them all the time. 
don't they? I mean, think about it. The Egyptians, thousands of years ago, they tried to pile their pyramids full of stuff because they thought that they could take their stuff with them. And we act like that too, right? I think it's so sad that people who have so much fail to see the blessing of sharing with those who are in need. We wait till we die to leave it in an inheritance to be taken by the government so that they can remember us and they can love us. And yet God says, look, I want you to remember and take care of people now. See the love and the joy that you can bring people now. Those of you who have much, it is the greatest thing that you can ever do is to share with someone who is in need. That's why we're doing this Christmas drive. That's why we're doing the Operation Christmas Child, to share with kids who literally have nothing, who won't receive anything this Christmas. Jim Carrey is one of my favorite actors. I don't know how you guys feel about Jim, but he's one of my favorite actors. And uh, he bothers me on some stuff, you know, his political views or whatever. But Jim actually recently said this. He said, I wish that everyone would become as rich as I am and realize that it's not all life is to be. I think that's important. When we realize we cannot take our stuff with us. Have you ever seen a U-Haul pulled behind a hearse? Anybody? No. You don't, right? You don't. Estate sale coming up. (laughs) You know what I mean? I mean, that's what we do. We spend our life collecting these things, and then we sell it for half the value that we bought it for, and then we pass it on. And that's why understanding you can't take your stuff with you. So share with those uh, who you have around you, who you love. And Paul deals with this over and over again in Scripture. He deals with this truth. Don't be worn down by thinking your stuff is your life. So contentment then comes from knowing that material things are only temporary. Trust that God will provide. Know that your stuff is only temporary. That's the second thing. Paul wrote this to Timothy. He says, look, I have food and I have clothing, and with these things I shall be content. And man, that's what we should strive after. Remember, this is an inner virtue here that we should strive after. Number three, understand that material things do not satisfy. You know, if I was going to try to figure this out on my own, if I didn't have very much, if I wanted to find out whether or not material things would satisfy, you know what I would do? I would go ask the people who have a lot of stuff. I mean, that makes sense, right? I would go ask people like Jim Carrey. I would go ask people who've hit the lottery. I would go ask people who have a lot of stuff, and I would ask them, do these things bring you ultimate happiness and purpose and value? That's what I would do. And so if we would to ask, if we were going to ask somebody, right, look in the Bible, I think the best person that we could ask would be Solomon. If you don't know who Solomon is, he was a king over Israel, the richest nation at that time. I mean, food and money and gold and the wonders of the world were shipping into Jerusalem, and he oversaw it all. And he wrote actually a few books in our Bible, Ecclesiastes being one of them. And Solomon wrote this in Ecclesiastes chapter 5. He says, he who loves silver will not be satisfied, nor he who loves abundance with increase. This is vanity. If you love these things, you'll never have enough. You'll never be satisfied. It will never make you happy. And he had all of these things, and he tried to find happiness. And finally, and all the wisdom that he had, he finally said, it doesn't work. It doesn't satisfy. All of this gold, all of this silver, All of these jewels, all of these women, all of this stuff, it doesn't bring me happiness. You see, those who who love materialism, their life will be dictated by materialism. And when your life is taken from you, you'll be empty, you'll be void, you'll have nothing. And you'll search after something to satisfy you. C.S. Lewis, really important, prominent Christian writer, he actually believed that God put a longing for God inside of each man, that within our hearts, he placed eternity, he placed this big void that if we would seek him, if we would find him, we would be satisfied. But here's the problem. We don't all look for God to fill that emptiness inside, right? We go from football game to football game, sports season to sports season, hobby to hobby, and we circulate around the calendar and we look for the next thing to satisfy us. We just hop from one thing to the other. And when that thing is over, we feel empty, we feel void inside, and and we just can't seem to be satisfied. And so we try to find things to fill our emptiness. And I think that that is true. In fact, the Bible talks about that in Acts chapter 16, or excuse me, Acts chapter 17, it says, God has made from one blood 
every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth. And he has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. And then look at this. This is what he says. So that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each of us. I think C.S. Lewis had it right. Every single person in this room has an emptiness inside, some form of a void that we seek to fill. And when you fill it with material things that do not last, you'll never be satisfied. You'll never be full. You'll always look for the next thing. And this is the danger of the sin of coveting. This is why it's so dangerous, is because it never leaves you full. People who are addicted to sex, they fill themselves with sex and then they feel disgusting and empty and void. People who fill themselves with gambling and money and then they lose it, empty, void. People who fill themselves with these material things just leave you empty and feeling disgusted with yourself. Trust the word of God. Trust what God has to say, that you have a void in your heart that only he can satisfy. When I look at my life, I often think, I don't know how non-Christians do it. I really don't. I do not know how people who do not have a relationship with Jesus continue to find meaning and purpose in their life that is satisfactory. Oh, material things, they bring pleasure, right? But when they're gone, you have to refill. It's like your gas, uh, gas uh, pump. You got to refill it or else you, you constantly feel empty. And I just simply don't know how people live without Jesus. I don't know how I ever did it, when even being a teenager, how I found so much purpose and meaning in life, and I assume I didn't, which is why I came to the cross, which is why I gave my life to Jesus Christ. And I want to encourage you to do the same thing this Christmas season, not only this Christmas season, but leave here determined, I am going to be satisfied and filled with the Lord. I am not going to let materialism be my God and my idol. So in wrapping up with this point, contentment comes then from understanding that material things will never provide lasting fulfillment. That's number three, or excuse me, number four. And here's, here's the final truth. True contentment is a gift from God. It is a gift from God that we should ask God, fill my heart, help make me whole, make me satisfied and hunger and thirst for you and only you. Psalms chapter 107, verses 8 and 9 says this, Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men, for he satisfies the longing soul and he fills the hungry soul with his goodness. Only God will be able to satisfy you. Only God will be able to fill your soul with hope and happiness and fulfillment and joy that will not be empty, that will not run out. And when you find yourself in the new heavens and the new earth and all of these material things have faded away and we get new stuff, your life will be focused. You see, that's the beautiful thing about a virtue is that it prepares you for the next life. And we will get a new heavens and a new earth And we will walk on that earth and we will talk on that earth and we will sing and we will have joy. I love the book of Isaiah because once Isaiah starts getting towards the end, after Isaiah chapter 53, he talks about Jesus, he starts to look out towards the distant future. When this world has faded away, when our material stuff is gone, and Isaiah writes this in Isaiah chapter 55, look at the picture that he paints for us and what we get to enjoy. He says, everyone who thirsts come to the waters. You who have no money, come buy and eat. Yes, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good. Let your soul delight itself in the abundance. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear and your soul shall live and I will make an everlasting covenant with you. Free bread, free water, free food that satisfies. And we're not talking about the stuff that's on our table in the new heavens and the new earth. He says, I will make an everlasting covenant with you. He is pointing to Jesus, the bread of life, the hope of life, that which satisfies us forever. God invites us, and guess what? It's free. You don't have to spend money at Martin's for Thanksgiving. You don't have to spend money at the Christmas store and decorate your house with lights. All of that will be provided for you. It is free, but it comes at a cost. A cost was paid on the cross. A cost was paid through Jesus Christ. And the only way 
that you get to cash in on the free gift of God is to be a follower of Jesus. So our final point is this. Contentment comes then when God sees fit to bless us with that which truly satisfies the mercies of David, the Messiah, Jesus. Somebody that I really respect, um, Helen Keller. Now, Helen Keller, unfortunately, in our age, a lot of students have made fun of her, mocked her um, for being blind and deaf, and there's things all over the internet that just poke fun at her. But what a strong young girl. To be deaf, to be blind, to be mute, and yet to still have some form of purpose in life. I mean, can you imagine having deafness and blindness and you can't speak and you have to try to learn? I mean, I can't imagine being in that situation. And yet she wrote this, and this is so amazing. She was blind, deaf, and mute, and she said, they took away what should have been my eyes, but I remembered Milton's paradise. They took away what should have been my ears, but Beethoven came and wiped away my tears. They took away what should have been my tongue, but I talked with God when I was young. He would not let them take away my soul, possessing that I still possess the whole. She got it. She knew what life was all about. And here she was, this young little girl, finding purpose and fulfillment in life, not in what she could see, not in what she could hear, not in what she could say, but who she had a relationship with. She was whole. And that's what the Lord's Supper really points us to, is that we look and we seek and we try to find everything that can satisfy us. And yet Jesus sat down with his disciples and he broke the bread and he poured the fruit of the wine in the cup and he says, this is the new covenant, the new covenant that Isaiah prophesied back in Isaiah 55. This is the body, this is the blood of Jesus that was shed and broken for us. And he broke it and he gave thanks. And he says, I want you to do this as often as you meet in remembrance of me. In other words, I want you to always remember what life is really about. It is about a relationship with God that was made possible through the sacrifice of Jesus. And so as the offering that, or as the uh, the plate that gets passed around, it's gonna have a loaf of bread. It's gonna have a cup with juice. And that is a symbolism of the body and the blood of Jesus that was broken and shed for us. And I want you to remember what Jesus did for you. Put your sins and your struggles and your covetousness and your discontentment out of your mind and remember and proclaim, I have been made whole by the blood of Jesus. God, thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for your love. Thank you for the fact that you died for us, Lord. And Father, I pray that as we take this cup, which is your blood, and this bread, which is your body, that we will remember, Lord, that only you can satisfy, only you can fulfill. God, we are so thankful for this sacrifice that you have made. We are so thankful that you died on the cross for our sins, that you would fill our lives, Lord, that you would fill our lives with purpose and meaning and hope, that we are not bound by the decisions that we've made in the past, but we are set free to live for you. God, thank you for giving us your relationship. Thank you for placing in our hearts an empty longing that only you can fulfill. God, you are so good. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for dying for us. And it's in the name of your son that we pray. Amen.